I think we'll uh, I think we'll begin. Uh, there'll be a few more drifting in, I'm sure, as we're talking. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to the Atlantic Council. Uh, we're pleased to have you here this morning to discuss this very timely and important issue in the world of energy geopolitics. And I think the importance of this issue is a uh, it is emphasized by the large crowd that we have this morning, and I think it's also a credit to the uh, uh, really uh, incredible panel uh, that we have. Uh, today's event will focus on the recent leadership changes uh, in Saudi Arabia and what these changes mean uh, for global energy markets as well as regional stability uh, and security. Uh, and I'd also like to mention that today's event is a cross-center collaboration between three of the centers here at the Council. I guess I should have introduced myself. I'm Dick Morningstar. I'm the founding director of our Global Energy Center, and uh, we're obviously involved in this program, but also uh, the Rafiq Hariri Center for the Middle East, and Frank Richardone, Richardone our amb uh, former ambassador to uh, Turkey and to Egypt, is the director and will be part of the panel. Uh, and the Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security. So I want to thank all of the centers here uh, for their cooperation in organizing this event. I want to give a special welcome uh, to the only two-time ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'm sure many of you know and remember Ambassador Walter Cutler, uh, who was here. Uh, and as well as our esteemed board member, Ode Aberdeen, who's also a, a true expert uh, on the Middle East. Uh, we have uh, uh, really an outstanding panel uh, of experts to discuss these important issues uh, today. Uh, the discussion will be moderated by uh, David Goldwyn, who I'm sure most of you know, who's the chairman of the Atlantic Council's Energy Advisory Board. Uh, and the president of Goldwyn Global Strategies, which is an international energy advisory consultancy. Uh, David has had, uh, I've known him for, God, 20 years, basically, uh, and has had a long and distinguished career in both the public and private sectors. We were colleagues in the State Department when, while well, David was the special envoy for and coordinator for international energy affairs while I was doing Eurasian affairs. Uh, and uh, we cooperated and worked together going back to the 90s on things like the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline and many other things. Um, today's panelists include uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Cordesman, who is the Arley A. Burke Chair in Strategy uh, for C at CSIS. Um, Dr. Cordesman is, as, I'm, as you all know, is an expert on U.S. security, energy, and Middle East policies and the author of more than 50 books. Um, he's also served as a consultant to both the State Department and the Defense Department during the Afghan and Iraq wars and has worked extensively uh, in Saudi Arabia and throughout the Gulf. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned Ambassador Richard Doney, who's the vice, vice president here at the, at the Council and director of the Rafi Kariri Center for the Middle East. Uh, and prior to joining the Council, Frank was a, a long-time career foreign service officer, has, has been ambassador to Turkey, Egypt, Philippines, Philippines. yeah. God, three times. Uh, and so obviously a, a, a very distinguished career. And finally, uh, Dr. Jean-Francois Cesnac, uh, who is teaching at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown, also at, John, at uh, Johns Hopkins, at the Sice School at Johns Hopkins. And Dr. Cesnac is an expert on energy-based industries in the, in the Gulf. He has over 25 years experience in international banking and finance. And I'm also happy to announce, very happy to announce, that as of officially last night, uh, Dr. Sesnick has joined the Global Energy Center as a senior fellow. So we uh, couldn't be happier than to have such a, an esteemed expert working with us. And uh, so uh, let me just finally say that for the audience of, uh, and th for the audience here, and for those watching the live webcast, you can contribute to the conversation on Twitter by utilizing the hashtag at uh, 
AC Energy and AC Mideast. And so I hope you'll extend a warm, we warm welcome to the panel. The panel will come up on stage, and I will turn it over to our moderator, David. Thank you. Thanks, Dick, and welcome, everyone. We have uh, quite the distinguished crowd in the audience today, so we'll make sure we leave plenty of time for, for questions. Well, we're here this morning to talk about um, the leadership changes in Saudi Arabia, and obviously it's of, of great interest from judging by this crowd and, and the folks watching at home, and that's because Saudi Arabia is, is clearly central to the oil market. Their decision in 2014 uh, not to, uh, to pursue market share and not to seek a production cut has certainly rippled across oil markets and across the world. They're central to, to regional stability uh, and to regional security, and certainly the air attacks in Yemen uh, have had uh, consequences across, uh, across the Gulf. And they're central to, to diplomacy, too, for the role they would play in, uh, in reacting to the P5 plus 1 deal with Iran and for, um, uh, and for the containment of ISIL as well. And so um, that's why we've got this panel here today. And I, I guess I want to start with the, with the leadership changes. Tony, because people were used to very slow, steady, uh, you know, changes in Saudi leadership. And when uh, King Salman came to power and three months later uh, removed the crown prince, it started to uh, cause vibrations across the diplomatic community about whether or not um, this was pretty fast, whether it signaled something. So I wonder if you can just take us through the leadership changes and, and what they mean and what this says about um, the stability of leadership in Saudi Arabia. Well, first, in terms of disclosure, I have to admit that I have gone from never trusting anybody over 30 to no longer trusting anybody under 70. So I may <laughs> bring a bias to this issue. But I think one needs to be really careful. The king is probably not in perfect health. He is old. He faces a time period in which consolidating power, achieving something as a leader, pushes him toward taking decisive action. I remember more than a year before he became king, being in Saudi Arabia and everybody was talking about the pressures and changes that would occur when Abdullah was then critically ill, and there was a risk he would die. And I think having been through this again and again and again, watching this focus on the royals, we need to be extremely careful. Because these changes do matter, but often we don't really pay attention to changes because they involve a minister of defense or a significant shakeup in the Ministry of the Interior. Or you abolish the National Security Council and you create a whole new top security structure and it produces absolute indifference on the part of the media except for a few experts who write commentary that doesn't get much pickup. The most dramatic shift here, I think, is that you have a very young Minister of Defense. That is an uncertainty. But looking back at this over the years, we have done about as well in understanding these shifts as people do in picking a fantasy football team. There are all kinds of theories about what this leader will be, there are all kinds of extrapolations based on what they did in the past. People turn to one expert or another, and anybody who has been in Saudi Arabia realizes that characterizing the royals is almost an ongoing sport. As long as you only talk to one Saudi, you'll get a very clear explanation. Now, my background is in areas like planning, uh, dealing with the national security, the intelligence, the defense structure. And I have not focused on things like education or the many other areas that really matter in the kingdom. But what I have seen is an awful lot of structural consistency. And you do have very powerful institutions. You have budgets. 
you have plans that have a driving impact on a lot of what the kingdom does. And I think that the shift here, frankly, it was time, really time that you had a younger prince, and it's not really that young, made crown prince. You needed a figure that could handle a transition, handle the security issues, that was strong enough to lead and provide some degree of bridging. So I think in the case of Muhammad, you have somebody who had proven his capability in what today in the kingdom may be the most critical focus, which is its immediate concern with security rather than internal development or the structural problems I think that Frank will get into. The most serious shift had already taken place. He'd become Minister of Defense. He had displaced Bandar. You had gotten rid of a much more risk-oriented approach to dealing with Syria than was the case under Mohammed. You had less focus on taking a kind of independent and somewhat risk-oriented security structure. All of that happened long before this sudden shift. Putting a relatively young man in as Minister of Defense, well, the problem is when you look back at this, this has always been a very odd job in Saudi Arabia. Because the Ministers of Defense have always had something else to do by way of appointments, or they have been somewhat transitional, and the decision-making structure has, in many ways, been technocratic and professional within the services, or it has moved up into a more consensus-oriented structure. Remember, if you go back to Prince Sultan, who certainly did review all major decisions procurement activity and so on, he was not at the same time by any means a micromanager. Uh, his son did not become the Minister of Defense. He was followed by someone who again did not emerge as a strong central controlling figure. And that has been a pattern which may or may not continue. We'll find out in several ways. One of them is going to be what happens in the areas where the kingdom faces immediate security challenges. Iraq, Syria, dealing with Lebanon, <coughs> dealing with Yemen, the whole problem of relationships with Jordan, Egypt. These are issues where at any given time a relatively young man may be confronted with some serious defense-oriented decisions. But my guess would be that these will almost immediately move upwards and into a kind of royal court, senior leadership position. Now one thing that will be a major change is the shift to a foreign minister. I don't think there's anyone who would challenge the personal competence of Adel al Jaber, but he is not a member of the royal family. One of the key questions will be, when the first real crisis arises, what will the role of the foreign minister actually prove to be? And that may be a matter of influence as much as a matter of competence. And we'll find out, because in the real world, that's what happens when you have these shifts in leadership. Now there are a whole host of other shifts in leadership. When I looked at the actual announcement that came out of the palace and then the next three days, there was something like more than 30 people who were affected one way or another by these shifts. And a lot of them really matter in areas like education, health, we'll hear about energy later. 
What I didn't see was anything which would address the fundamental structure of how the department, or rather the kingdom, deals with defense. I didn't see a major shift that would affect the National Guard, although that may come. I didn't see a solution to creating a meaningful National Security Council equivalent, because there's been this building and there's been this title, but then you try to figure out what the hell actually happens at these buildings. And it seems to be somewhat personal and not where the decision making is structured. Saudi intelligence is going to be, I think, an open question. We'll see whether that emerges as better organized, more advanced. Uh, we have problems of our own in dealing with this region. And it certainly isn't simple. So I'm not in any sense particularly in a place where I would say, OK, we had one very dramatic midnight event, and it's fundamentally going to affect the security of the kingdom in predictable ways because of personalities. I don't think the midnight event was anywhere near as important as the changes that took place in the intelligence and national security structure before this. I have no way to know whether a young man is going to emerge as a more proactive, successful, or failed minister of defense in a system where the minister of defense's role was always a little anomalous in terms of actual exercise of power <coughs> by the standards of other governments. And one thing I am sure of is that when it comes down to actually allocating money, that's going to be a critical issue. We'll hear about that in terms of oil revenues. We'll hear about it in terms of how the kingdom has to deal with the other security issues we're going to discuss. But you spent about $81 billion a year of the kingdom's budget directly on defense. You steadily expanded internal security to the point where it now, in many ways, is a counterpart to the Ministry of Defense. The Ministry of the Interior is as important to Saudi security in a lot of ways as the Ministry of Defense is. How that will play out in an era of declining oil revenues, I don't know. The other issue is that when you look at this, you're also having to absorb something on the order of $90 billion worth of new arms orders from the United States alone over the next three to five years. And that is an immense challenge. And it is only the beginning. Since you're talking about 12 to 18 billion dollars worth of arms orders a year. Now that, if you would like me to bet on which royal wins or which royal succeeds the last royal, David, I'm going to have to give up because quite <laughs> frankly, uh, you can write all the op-eds and one-page summaries of this you want, but let's go back to the fantasy football image. Those of you who are lucky enough to get it right, if you ever bothered to play that game, congratulations. Well, I won't ask you to predict the future, but, but let me just come back with um, uh, this, this decision on, on Crown Prince Mukherjee, because it did seem that some of these questions were foreseeable, the leadership decisions were foreseeable. So did something happen between January and April, something in the external environment, some greater sense of urgency, or was it just a greater sense of mortality on the part of the king that led to that shift? Because it, it does seem anomalous, um, uh, even, even taking what you say into consideration about the, the you know, sort of the, the reasonability well, of the rest of the leadership changes. First, there hadn't been a deputy crown prince before. Second, for all the talk of this group that was supposed to review the selection of king, that was King Abdullah. Guess what? There's a different king. 
I think many people were very surprised by Mukran's appointment in the first place. And given the pressures on the kingdom again, the need for stability, for change, to go from an old king that does have some health problems to a stable succession at a time you face serious security challenges on all of your borders. I think if I had been suddenly shifted from crown prince to king, I would have done something very similar and done it very quickly. Very helpful. Jean-Francois, <coughs> excuse me, let's turn to you and talk about some of the, the changes in leadership in the, in the oil sector. And if you can take us through the changes at Aramco and at the ministry. And I think what underlies that is do, uh, what's the connection between these changes in leadership and any likely change in, in Saudi oil policy? Or are we, we also looking at steady as she goes? Well, thank you. Uh, I, I, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Kortzman that there's much too much emphasis on what the royals do or who they are and so on. I think in the case of the, the oil policy, I think we're still seeing a very, very strong technocratic structure uh, being in place and, in fact, in my view, somewhat reinforced, and unlike what we have seen in the press at times, whereby some people were saying, well, it's just King Salman trying to put his sons on each side of, of Saudi Ramco at the Supreme Council for Saudi Ramco, putting Mohammed bin Salman and Abdelaziz bin Salman as the minister who then will become, who could become minister and then chairman of Saudi Ramco. Well, it's not at all really what that happened. In fact, the changes was that the, uh, the, the Minister of Oil, and that's really the big changes, uh, Mr. Ariel Naimi, who's been really controlling policy of oil policy in Saudi Arabia over the past 20 years or so, he has been replaced. He's been trying to, to, uh, to resign for a long time to, because he wants to retire. He's 79 years old. But um, he uh, has been removed as, uh, from the board of directors of, of Saudi Ramco. So he's still minister of oil. But it has been announced that oil will no longer be handled by the Ministry of Petroleum and Minerals. So the Ministry of Petroleum and Minerals is really becoming the Ministry of Minerals <laughs> uh, and energy in general, I suppose. But uh, Khaled al Falia, who is a brilliant uh, man, uh, was CEO of Saudi Ramco, has been named Minister of Health. Uh, which is a very difficult position in Saudi Arabia, a huge budget, somewhat dysfunctional ministry, and his responsibility is to make it work. And at the same time, they named him chairman of Saudi Aramco. So now Saudi Aramco is really totally technocratic. Now, it always was. The board of directors doesn't have a single prince on the board of directors to this day. And uh, so the Minister of Oil, Ali Al Naimi, is no longer the, the, the chairman, but Khaled Al Fali is. Now, in terms of the, uh, the change, the big change supposedly was that there is now a Supreme Council for Saudi Ramco, which is supposed to be the sort of the uh, committee that sort of handles major decisions at Saudi Ramco. And that's been presented as being something very new. Well, it was not new. In fact, there was such a committee last year already. And before that, there was a Supreme Oil Petroleum Council, which was chaired by the king, co-chaired by the crown prince, with uh, so the minister of foreign affairs as one of the major uh, princes in charge of that committee. And that committee never did anything because everybody's too busy. And uh, Saud al Faisal never had the time to do anything. So in fact, Ali al Naimi was controlling policy at the Supreme Oil Council. Today. The, the, uh, uh, the Council for um, uh, Saudi Ramco, the Supreme Council for Saudi Ramco, is now controlled, chaired, I should say, by uh, Mohammed bin Salman. And that is viewed, of course, as a very important position, which it is. But the fact is Mohammed bin Salman has very little time on his hand to really manage oil policy, especially since it is so technocratic, so difficult to handle. However, the man in charge of this council is really, or the secretary general of the council, is a commoner. He's a, uh, Dr. Al Munif, uh, who uh, is going to, uh, to basically, in my view anyway, handle policy on behalf of Prince Salman. Now, the committee is supposed to be composed of 10 people, five from the board of Saudi Ramco, uh, Prince Salman, 
and I don't know who else will be, uh, will be there yet. At least I haven't read it. If it. Even if it has been announced, I have not read it. But in fact, what I'm saying really is that nothing much has changed. And uh, therefore, I don't expect policy to change very much either. So yes, indeed, uh, Mr. Ali Al Naimi is no longer directly involved in policy at Saudi Aramco. This may be a good thing in the long term. And Khaled El Falia, who is much more uh, of a technocrat, uh, will be uh, handling some basic policies, pass them on to the council. And the new uh, CEO is a temporary CEO and uh, is now uh, on the board of Saudi Ramco and, and a senior vice president of Saudi Ramco, and he will be handling the day-to-day -day relations, uh, the day-to-day -day business at Saudi Ramco. So um, just like Khaled al Falia was doing. Now, what's in, what's interesting to me is that Khaled al Falia is especially known at Saudi Ramco for having put Saudi Ramco into uh, chemicals. Uh, he has negotiated Petro Rabig with the Sumitomo, which is a, today a $20 billion company. Uh, it was $10 billion. They've just doubled the size, $20 billion company. And mostly, the big Sadara joint venture with Dow Chemical, which is also a $20 billion project. And those are very, very advanced chemicals. It's, it's putting Saudi Arabia in a totally different pattern. Uh, of, of, uh, of production. In fact, it may, it's making Saudi Aramco look a lot like ExxonMobil. And uh, I'm not sure the Saudis would like to hear that, but I think that's what's happening. And in fact, it's a very good thing, I think. Now, that may bring a lot of changes in the kingdom in terms of, uh, of, of running the economy, because SABEC, which itself is now the second largest uh, uh, chemical company in the world after BASF, SABIC has lost its chair, its uh, CEO. C the CEO is now working in the Ministry of Defense. Now, what is he doing in the Ministry of Defense? I'm not sure. I believe, and perhaps Dr. Kordsman would know better, but I think he's working on um, appropriations and things of this nature, which means, again, the, it's part of the professionalization of, of some of the problem uh, ministries, health with the uh, Khaled Al Fali and maybe Minister of Defense, Ministry of Defense. So uh, I would not be surprised if there was some reorganization in Saudi Arabia of maybe Saudi Ramco take, becoming much more of a chemical company because of Khaled Al Fali, or on the other hand, maybe take the chemicals away from Saudi Ramco, put them into SABEC. The, uh, in terms of the ministry of uh, itself, uh, now that the ministry is not supposed to be supervising Saudi Ramco, they still have to supervise the, uh, the rest of, uh, of, of their purview, which is minerals. And uh, Maden, which is a very important company in Saudi Arabia, still relatively small. But Maden is one of the largest fertilizer DAP manufacturers in the world today, and is doubling production. So uh, that is also in joint venture with SABIC today and with Mosaic of the United States. I think there will be a lot of reorganization at that level as well, making it much more professional. And we'll see how that develops. The purpose of all this is to end up having these large state companies provide facilities for smaller companies and so on to create jobs. One of the key issues, of course, is, is, uh, is defense or is security, as has been mentioned. But the second biggest issue, if not the biggest issue in Saudi Arabia today, is creating jobs for the young Saudis. And I would not be surprised if Mohammed bin Salman is now in place because they need to create jobs for 60% of the population, which is below the age of 30. <laughs> Just like, so they provided one job <laughs> already. But, uh, but uh, they, they need to, I think that's what's going to happen. Well, let me, let me come back to you, because I could, I could read the, the moving of the deck chairs in two ways. One is Saudi Aramco is going to be more technocratic. And maybe the energy ministry will be an energy ministry and look at increasing solar, yeah. using less of the oil for power generation finding ways to access gas. But the other way to read it is that there isn't a CEO of Saudi Aramco yet. The chairman has never been traditionally the leader of the organization, and he has two jobs. The role of the ministry is undefined, and Mohammed bin Salman is at the top of the chain with indetermined leadership. So you, you wrap that together. 
who really is in charge then of oil policy and deciding you know, how low can you go? Well, I think the policy, which was, in my view anyway, defined by Ali El Naimi in the past few years, will continue. So I don't think they have to make much of a decision at this point. I think the Saudis have decided that they were going to keep producing in order to create, uh, to impose its will on the markets and basically on the non-OPEC producers, and not just shale, but mostly Russia. But we have talked about this in the past. They may not <coughs> succeed anyway, but uh, they, the, that's the policy, I think. Um, who is going to make future policy? I think very much a combination of Khaled Falia and, and uh, Prince Mohammed, definitely. I think that's where the policy is going to be made. And uh, frankly, that's not much of a change. And the Abdulaziz is not a really a player in this? I'm sorry? Prince Abdulaziz is not really a player in, in this? In my view, well, if, if the Minister of Oil is, resigns, uh, Mr. Ali Al Naimi leaves uh, the ministry because of age and so on, uh, maybe he could be replaced by a Prince Abdelaziz who is now uh, a, has rank of minister as deputy, uh, but he doesn't have oil. So by removing the ministry from Saudi Aramco, they remove Abdelaziz just as much. So I think there will be almost no change. I, I would agree, though, that maybe Abdelaziz might be named to the council of 10 people, but it is not a huge position. And yes, I would agree that the ministry may go do uh, other things like solar, and because it's very big and they're trying to do more. Um, nuclear, maybe. Uh, maybe increase prices on natural gas. <laughs> Few odds and ends like this, which would create a lot of issues in the kingdom. So, but it's still a bit unsettled. And we'll see a lot more changes, as I started hinting, in terms of changes, at least in the industrial side of things, but I think also on the oil side. Terrific. Well, Frank, we've been uh, warned by Tony not just to focus on, on the royals, and, uh, and we've seen a bit of the generational change. You're just back from Saudi Arabia, and I think you've seen uh, a little bit of this generational change uh, up close. Can you tell us a little bit about what you saw and what you think it means? I can. I'd, I'd like to um, start by uh, confessing that there are people in this room, particularly not only in this panel, but, but in the front row here, people like Ambassador Cutler and others who have forgotten more about Saudi Arabia than I'll ever hope to learn. Um, and making probably only about my sixth trip to the kingdom over a span of a career doesn't make me an expert. Um, maybe more typical of what I was, a foreign service officer who can sometimes be a mile wide and an inch deep. Sometimes we flip and go the other way when we're, we get very deep in a particular subject. So I'm not deep in Saudi Arabia, but I have strong impressions um, because what I saw there was so uh, counter uh, my prejudices going in. Um, I had uh, followed the kingdom mostly from ringside seats in Egypt or Iraq or the um, Gulf elsewhere in the region um, over a number of years and all of us tend to think, all of us Americans, of, of Saudi Arabia is the most change resistant, the most conservative of all the uh, Gulf states and among the most conservative of all the Arab uh, players. Um, we've watched the center of gravity of the Arab world in so many fields, uh, business, uh, education, art, science, medicine, ideas, um, communications, media, shift from the, the, my beloved Umadunya, Cairo, um, and the Levant increasingly toward the Gulf. And we explain that, well, yes, of course, money will do that, all those petrodollars. Um, but then why, why is the kingdom evidently so resistant to change. We make so much when a ruler goes and this son or, or, or that person gets named and we, we speculate so much about the role of individuals. Anyway, I came with a lot of questions. And one of the conceptual frameworks I used to bring to the great privilege of the service I had as an American diplomat, foreign service officer, um, was um, sort of crystallized in a book about 15 years ago that probably most people here have heard about called The Tipping Point, Malcolm Gladwell. The job of uh, diplomats, good business people, good analysts and think tanks is to look for trends, um, not just the changes that are happening, but what are the changes that are going to happen? Not just the threats of instability and revolution when we think about tipping points, but the opportunities 
where are, th where are tomorrow's uh, sort of explosive trends and fashions and uh, business opportunities going to come from? And if, um, if you think about the, the work of Malcolm Gladwell, there's been some more writing about over the years. It, there are things like the law of the few. There are things that hide in plain sight. Often trends are counterintuitive until they become obvious and they break out. One of them is the law of the few. It doesn't take a majority of people starting to think in a, in a certain way to make the trend. By the time it's a majority, the trend is well underway. So the, there's a few people that he calls them the mavens, or the salesmen, um, the connectors, people who are passionate about something, see something, want others to understand. Um, you know, and, and in a short visit, as such as I had, I, I, there's no hope of having a representative sample, OK? And that wasn't the point. The, the, the point was to expose me, to educate me, uh, to some interesting things going on. So the, the proximate reason to go there was something that I thought would be very staid. It was something called uh, the Institute for Diplomatic Studies. It has a, a bit of a relationship with the Atlantic Council, uh, principally heretofore through the Brent Scowcroft Center for Strategic and Defense Studies. So I went thinking, OK, you know, it's a Saudi institution, and they're the usual ways of dealing with them and all that. And I had my expectations uh, firmly under control. We went, several day conference, very well organized, more, th uh, more than just older guys. Uh, people speak, four women from the uh, Shorter Council, very outspoken, very articulate, not just Saudi officials, uh, people from the world of business, private sector, and uh, a really rich interchange, respectful, but not inhibited in a, in a way that I expected to find. A lot of interesting ideas and, and uh, banter and so forth of, you know, I've, I've, I have been in the kingdom before, but it was just fresher and better. I thought, okay, well, this is a positive impression. One swallow doesn't make a spring. Um, I had been in touch with Prince Turkey. He wasn't uh, available, so I met with his son, Khaled, who is a uh, uh, one of the leaders of something called the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies. He pointed out to me that that for research was added to the title. It used to be the King, Khalid, uh, King Faisal Center for Islamic Studies, and they collect uh, venerable copies of the Quran, and they do exegesis in this. Um, but what he wanted to talk about, and one of his scholars, uh, Saud al-Sarhan, uh, wanted to talk about, was their research. And it was research with, he gave, they gave me a stack of publications, which I actually kind of looked through to assess for you know, how they stack up against what we do in Washington. They were in English, strikingly. They do some in, in Arabic as well. And I thought they were pretty good, pretty interesting, including assessments on American foreign policy in the region, which was not polemical. It was pretty insightful and thoughtful. And assessments on, as you would expect, uh, Iran, Syria, um, Egypt, the region, um, not, not simply justifying the kingdom's outlooks on things, but really pretty, pretty thoughtful, uh, legitimate scholarship. And uh, the conversation itself was wide-ranging, interesting, very probing, in the way of, uh, uh, of uh, Prince Turkey himself. I could see the, the father and the son, Princeton educated. So, nephew. Anyways, it was... Um, it, that was, again, just positive, not, not another swallow making the spring. Um, and then finally, I went to something that was startling. Uh, even in its very title, and even after hearing the title, I, I, my expectations were this can't be for real. The title of this institute, which uh, is at uh, Prince Sultan University, all-male campus, they haven't built the female campus yet, 70% majority of female students on that campus. That was interesting for me. Intermingled, not, uh, not visibly segregated to me. Um, there's an institute called the Institute for the Study, in, in English they call it, the Study of Innovation in Government. And in Arabic, it's even a little more startling than that. It's, it's uh, uh, governmental creativity, ibtikat hukumi. And I thought, you know, even in Washington, if you heard such a name for a think tank, you'd, you'd have all kinds of snarky comments about <laughs> governmental innovation. Ha, ha, ha. How impossible, how counter, 
uh, experiential is something like that. But they actually meant it, as it turns out. It was started uh, when it was the Prince Salman Center for Innovation and Government, now the King Salman Center for Innovation and Government. And uh, I met with about a dozen people, uh, four or five Americans. I think all the Americans were women. Um, I will mention uh, two women in the, in the course of my remarks here. One of them uh, is an American named Ann Habibi, who is a, a real management consultant in organizational change. She has her own consultant. She, she's from Harvard, um, goes between Boston and uh, Riyadh to do this work. Um, I think it's called uh, one, one World, All the World, All World Live Network. Um, and so she's a management consultant on management change. Serious professional, long uh, established track record in working in that field in the United States. And they hired her, of all people, to lead this effort. And she brought in other people who had experience with uh, Deloitte and uh, you know, maybe McKinsey, different management consulting firms. But it wasn't just these few Americans. There were then the thing that, that gets to the point about a tipping point and makes me wonder. And it's made me come back and ask my staff to do some more research. And I, I put it out here for anyone else who might want to do research on the question of, are, is there a tipping point happening uh, or several in different fields in the kingdom as well as uh, across the Gulf, perhaps more broadly? And I mean a positive tipping point. I don't mean a tipping point toward um, revolution or not negative, you know, violent uh, political revolution. I mean positive revolutions. Um, and that is this. There were um, over half a dozen, I'll say maybe about eight Saudis, ranging in age from their 20s into probably approaching 40. One of them had come back from study at Oxford. Uh, the others had all come back from study in the United States. One uh, was a woman, didn't cover her hair amongst the other uh, men in the room, much less her face, all dressed you know, demurely in uh, uh, sort of black robes. Um, and the conversation was, was really uh, insightful, uh, full of passion for what they're doing. They really wanted us to understand what they were about and how important it was. So this uh, King Salman Center for Innovation and in Government started as an idea in 2013, revved up in 2014, initial studies underway. 2015, they published a catalog of the 227 agencies that they found of the kingdom's government. I mean, they thought to actually survey, what is the government here? What does it look like? Then they took. I don't recall about 30 of those, and dug down into how they're working. Best practices compared to worldwide management best practices. What's working, what's not working, e-governance, apps, how's it serving the people? Uh, what's working, what needs to be thrown out, what needs to be abolished, consolidated, uh, disaggregated? Who are the best leaders, how to hold them to account? Um, they have published on this, and they're doing more work. And these. Uh, young Saudis are fired up and evidently feel released and empowered to do it. Again, one swallow does make a spring, I don't know. But the datum that I think, or the data that I think uh, merits some analysis, some gathering and analysis, uh, come from the work of the other, uh, or just touched upon by a, a small piece by one of our staff, a young lady, uh, Stephanie House here, Ali who couldn't join us today. She's off. Um, and I don't know whether Anne Habibi is in Boston or, or the kingdom at this moment, or I'd have asked uh, her to join us. Perhaps we can have her come here. Um, is about the numbers of Saudis who have studied in this country or Europe and gone back. If you go back to Gladwell's work, you see that different things matter in examining and analyzing trends, tipping points, before they reach the tipping point. Um, and one of them is numbers do matter, but they don't have to be really great. They just have to reach a certain threshold. In 2005, King Abdullah and President Bush got together at his ranch and decided to have a major scholarship program to send people to the United States. They sent five or 6,000 in the first year. Uh, it was around <coughs> 2005. Maybe the that was the first year they came. 
by now there are about 100,000 Saudis actively studying in the United States. Many of those now over this decade have returned. Um, similar stories across the Gulf. The numbers were small in earlier years. They grew, 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 grew. It is quite a trend of fashion, a movement, if you're a well-to-do person in the Gulf, to send your kids not just to the West, but to the United States, and typically very ambitiously for the best places. And then they come back. They're not all immigrating to the United States. They're going back, running the family businesses. They're not going to sinecures, necessarily. Famously, a lot of employment in the Gulf is make work. OK, get it. But the people I saw were not in make work jobs. They were fired up. They weren't working for the pay. They were passionate about what they were doing in the way that people at the Atlantic Council are or, or you know, other best institutions around the United States. So I guess that's the, the area for further study I'd look at, not just the demographics. We all know that a, there's a youth demographic across the Arab world and, and particularly in places of the Gulf, and that starts to taper off as, as they urbanize. But what, what is a <coughs> subset who have studied, not visited, not just tourism, but lived among Americans British, and I, I choose the English-speaking world advisedly. Why? Because that's how you link to the world of the internet and ideas, and you read everything that's out there. Some are, some are going to France um, and, uh, and other countries in the West. But so what are those numbers? major currents of modernization. And yeah. Right. What, are the, what are the channels there? How many are they? Where are they concentrated? Um, surveying them, what are their experiences? We get a lot of episodic stuff. Foreign service officers, when they sort of report analysis, do a lot. They get some data, but a lot of it's impressionistic. You talk with three, four, five people, others, and you, and you make some vast conclusions from these things, like I'm doing here. Um, but I'm saying it should be tested. And look at the numbers. And are they reaching a tipping point where people are coming back, male and female, and having impacts on institutions of civil society and even government? And, and big companies. And it's famously been in the oil, oil industry over a long time, of course. Anyway, I put that as a question for further research. Stephanie's doing it with us. And uh, <coughs> I just was blown away by the work that Anne Habibi is doing in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Terrific. Fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, Tony. Frank, I have to say that having done some surveys there, first, it's always interesting to be sent by the Saudis to places where Saudiization is supposed to have occurred and find no Saudis. Mm -hmm. It is also a fact that no five-year plan for the last four or five-year plans has reflected a serious improvement in Saudiization. You've got, and I'm going to give you CIA figures, approximately 11 million people in the labor force. It's hard to estimate. 80% of those are foreign. Approximately 600,000 Saudis reach job age every year. Youth unemployment among Saudis 24 and under is rated at close to 30%. Now, you have a lot of money going into job creation economic cities. But you also have the oddity that more women graduate from secondary school and university, and they take far more serious courses because it isn't dominated by religious instruction. You look at those demographics, and you take them into account because, <coughs> yes, we have those people. But we also can look at significant parts of the kingdom where that development hasn't occurred, where there are constant security problems, where there has been a difficulty with Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and now rising attacks that have begun to emerge from the Islamic State, and not all of them are out in rural areas or the border. There are serious security problems in areas like Riyadh, and the kingdom has had to react. So, Yes, we need to get to the numbers, but, and there are a lot of positive trends. But I think we have to be very, very careful about the demographics here. And this is a country that's gone through an incredible amount of population pressure. It's technically more than 84% urbanized, 
going from something like less than 10% in 1950, and you get an idea of the stress involved. So yes, there are tipping points, but I think we need to be very careful. They can tip in two directions. Let me take you in, a, in another direction. Let's talk a little bit about Yemen and Iran, and then I want to come back on, on, on oil policy before we open it up. But um, we've seen a sort of a, a new level of engagement by the Saudi military in local conflict. Um, and in particular, the air campaign in, in Yemen may not have gone as well as uh, so far as, as they intended. I wonder if you could talk about what this means for, for Saudi's role in the region. And is this a vulnerability? Uh, Mohammed bin Salman has been the face of this campaign. He has been, it has been more personalized maybe than, um, than, than is traditional in, uh, in Saudi politics. But if it goes badly, is it a vulnerability for him? And is it, a, in fact, an opening for further Iranian aggrandizement if it looks like uh, the campaign goes poorly? Well, I think we need to be very careful in looking at this. It's an air campaign which has begun. Looking at the claims, it's very difficult to figure out what has actually happened. But certainly they have hit quite a number of military and security targets. What, if anything, they've accomplished in dealing with the Houthi and Shiite population, that's very hard to determine. Partly because it's a very mixed population in the area around Sana and in the YAR, 35% of the population of Yemen, roughly, nobody knows precisely, is Shiite. The Houthi are only part of a much broader movement, and the head of state, remember, was a Shiite for many, many years. Uh, dancing on the head of snakes was done by a Shiite, not by a Sunni. The other side of this is, at the end of this, did they seriously think they could bring the previous leader back? I don't think that was something you can blame on the Minister of Defense. And I'm not sure anybody thought they could. If the bombing campaign is followed by some kind of political deal and by buying off the right amount of power brokers, and calling Yemen a democracy is, shall we say, one of those many American generalizations which doesn't have much correlation to reality, then it may be somewhat successful. But the broader problem in Yemen, I think, is reflected that what you don't see in the bombing campaign is for years they've been debating whether there should be a truly massive barrier defense along the border. And the answer now seems to not only be yes, but to try to create a buffer zone on the Yemeni side to try to block the flow of illegals. But it is mostly to try to contain the problem while essentially ensuring you don't have major Iranian influence. Now, the Saudis have a much more negative view of Iranian influence in the Houthi movement than the US does. We don't see that level of arms transfers or presence. But what I think we can all agree on is, OK, there's a bombing campaign. I think it's fair to say that Yemen is one of the few countries in the world that most people who are development experts have given up on. There is no way to deal with the population pressure the water, the failed economy, the other factors involved. It is going to be unstable and a mess indefinitely into the future. And that's something that's gotten lost in this focus on the air campaign, which seems to have been, incidentally, for what they were trying to do, reasonably effective, which is a message being sent. Now, it did reveal some other problems, which had nothing to do with this young minister of defense. Saudi Arabia has needed to turn its Red Sea fleet into a real fleet for about the last 20 years. They haven't done it. They need to give their fleet in the Gulf the same level of modernization that they've given their Air Force. They haven't done it. These are basic structural problems 
that affect their security that need solution. Now, whether this has anything to do with the appointment of a young prince is an open issue. They have a major problem in their military cities, which are reorganizing by trying to put a new one in Yemen combined with a new port. But they tend to be static. They don't give mobility. We talk about Yemen because that's today's headlines. They've been deeply involved in the Syrian civil war from the start. Let me say that Prince Bandar was a little bit of a disaster. It was an open contest as to who could do the worst job of trying to intervene in Syria. The Obama administration or Prince Bandar, and there's a great thesis to be written on comparative incompetence. <laughs> if any of you are trying to have a doctorate, uh, you have the problem of Iraq, where I think we've done better, and they've been too isolated, unwilling to engage. But Iraq's on their border. It's real. And the Islamic State in the Al Nusra Front and Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which has nothing to do with the Houthi, are real threats. They're active. They have attacks. They have a very effective, I think, counterterrorism force, but they also have terrorism. You have very weak partners. Nobody wants to talk about Oman, but it has a very weak, ill head of state, growing security problems, its own demographic and economic problems. They're caught up with the Bahrain, where let's be very frank about it. You have a deeply divided royal family that paralyzes movements toward real reform. You have Qatar, which seems to be a little more balanced, but frankly depends on us for real defense. It is not really part of the Gulf Cooperation Council in an integrated sense. You have a Kuwait with its own divided royal family, less visible, which is undergoing its own internal political problems and is right on the border of Iraq and Iran. And from a Saudi viewpoint, whatever you may think of Yemen, understand that if we solve the nuclear problem the way we're planning to, what we're really saying is we'll keep them at something approaching the breakout level with about two years of warning indefinitely into the future. We won't solve what is a massive buildup in Iranian missile capabilities. We won't address a major buildup in asymmetric warfare capabilities in the Gulf. We're not going to deal with the expansion of Iranian influence. Let me say, in all of these issues, which when I talk to Saudis, dominate their perceptions of security, along with their own Shiites and their own internal security problems, focusing on the age of the present Minister of Defense and focusing only on Yemen isn't terribly realistic. And one problem we need to remember is, yes, this is a long way away from us. It's right on their borders, on all their borders. And these are debates which go far beyond all of this focus on the leadership and where I think there's a lot of continuity, but no good answers. None of these problems seem likely to go away in the next half decade. And that's probably optimistic. Well, on that happy note, Jean-Francois, let me ask you uh, <coughs> <clears throat> for another pessimistic note, it doesn't sound like the prospects for uh, Iraq, Iran, Saudi uh, accord on uh, production are very much in the offing. But tell me, let's talk a little bit about how does this play out? If the P5 plus one agreement comes on, Iran will revive maybe 700,000, a million barrels a day of pre-sanctions production, maybe sometime in 2016, late in 2016. Iraq is reported to be able to deliver a million barrels a day, year-on-year -year increase, if the Foul Peninsula revamp um, takes off as planned, which is a question. And so how is this going to play out, given the challenges in the, you know, in the regional dynamics? Um, 
is this a race to the bottom, or does revenue maximization trump everything else, and will we see, will we see a, a production cut at some point? Very easy questions, uh, David. Oh. Uh, um, but I, I think to, to bring back in this, in this question, to bring back the Yemeni issue, I think, I think that one of the reasons the Saudis are so intent on, on show, making a show of force in Yemen is really to, uh, to show to the Iranians that they exist as a military power, maybe not very strong, but they exist. And they have to be accounted with in any kind of settlement. So if the P5 plus 1 arrangement takes place, I would not be surprised if there was an arrangement between Iran and Saudi Arabia on many other subjects. Because I think everybody understands that you cannot fight uh, Daesh or Islamic State just with uh, Saudi Arabia alone. You have to have a Saudi Saudi-Iranian arrangement. If that doesn't happen, the Islamic State will continue to, to survive and do pretty well. So if the arrangement uh, works out and the Saudis move forward with the Iranians on developing more of a stable situation in Syria in particular and in Iraq, I think there will be a lot of things will happen at the same time. Now, in terms of the oil, uh, oil production, yes, I w definitely the Iranians can produce uh, 600, 700,000 barrels more, but in a year or two years. And the Saudis have time to, to deal with that in the sense. Let's, let's remember, I think that, uh, and there are people in this room who know this much better than, than I do anyway, but I think the focus of Iran is really on natural gas. And if, Saudi, if Iran can find some capital uh, to reestablish their gas fields, they can start producing. Today, Iran is a net importer of natural gas, and it has the second largest reserves in the world. So they could start exporting their gas to Pakistan or to Turkey and even through Turkey to Europe and whatnot. So there is a, an enormous amount of possibilities for, for Iran. They could develop their liquid natural gas industry, which is non-existent at this point. Uh, a lot of people would be quite happy to help them develop this if, they, if the gas can be produced. So I think the gas angle of this could be one of the part of the deals they work out with the Saudis in that sense. So I'm not too worried about uh, the race to the bottom in terms of pricing. Because if part of the deal is the Saudis could reduce production a little bit to make up for some little by little increase in the Iranian production. Now, where you mentioned Iraq is a lot more of a problem. Because Iraq has much more capacity to increase production if there was some kind of arrangement in Iraq. Now, Today, I was reading in the Middle East Economic Survey yesterday, I think that uh, uh, the Kurdish territories are very upset at Iraq because Iraq is not paying and according to the agreement they made in January. So the Kurds are basically being pushed out again. And they could start producing. There's not big production, but we have our own companies up there. They, can, they have their own pipeline to go to Turkey. And so the and it's not huge amounts of oil, but it could mount up to half a million, maybe a million barrels eventually over a couple of years. But Iraq is really in deep trouble. Uh, if they cannot have the security arrangement uh, totally worked out, I don't see any much increase in Iraqi oil. Now, they have last month, they were producing more than, exporting more than ever. But uh, that's including the Kurdish oil uh, or the oil which on the Kirkuk field, which was invaded by the Kurds. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I'm not sure we're going to see. I, I, maybe I should not, but I actually discount Iraq as a problem in the terms of the race to the bottom at this point. Uh, if things actually, if the Iranian-Saudi agreement ever takes place or took place, then the, there might be some arrangement in Iraq who will then could produce more in the, but we're talking three, four, five years down the line, eternity in price of, in terms of oil. Well, let's turn to the, uh, the audience, and I think we can start with uh, Ambassador's row, and then uh, we'll take two or three questions at a time, just so we make sure we get everyone in. Yes. Okay. Oda Aberdeen on the board of the Atlantic Council. One thing has not been mentioned in this discussion, King Salman comes to power with more experience in foreign policy, in domestic policy, than his predecessors. He had seen Saudi foreign policy 
with the U.S., with the Arab countries, with Europe. He was governor of Riyadh. He has excellent relationship with the business community, with the tribal community. And this is something that should be emphasized, that you have a king who has experience, you have a king who has traveled, you have a king who has good relationship with many leaders in the Arab world. And that's something that should be emphasized. Great. Let's take a couple more. <coughs> Pastor Keller. Uh, yes, thank you. Very interesting discussion. Uh, I go way back in Saudi Arabia, but I've managed to return once in a while. And uh, But I go back to the days when uh, King Salman was Prince Salman and Governor Riyadh. And I think some people looking at it from afar think, well, what's a governor? He was much more than a governor of a, the capital or the, or the province. He was the, on the inside of policy making in the royal family for years and years. At the same time, uh, uh, Crown Prince, uh, well, not then King Abdullah, uh, he, he was the number two, and I tried to keep in touch with him, and I thought to myself, gee, you know, this, this fellow is a Bedouin. How can he ever run a country? And I think, I don't know about how you feel, but I think I was astonished to see how he took over. Uh, he had hardly traveled outside uh, the Arab world. And uh, I think instituted a lot of very important reforms. Some people could say they weren't enough, but whatever. Anyway, I think the leadership has been very good. But let me just go to, to the one question which, which you raise, and that is education. Uh, the, Saudi Arabia is, has done marvelously on educating, and the 100,000 uh, Saudis who are studying in the United States, it's, 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 it's very, very good for our bilateral relationship and for the country, but, but it does relate to something called jobs. We just had the president of Tunisia here last week, and he made that point too. In Tunisia, he said under President Bourguiba and then afterwards, there were two reforms, women, and education. Women, it's okay, but the education, now we have so many educated people without jobs. And I think obviously this is a risk for Saudi Arabia. And, and you mentioned Saudization, the whole idea that you've got to get away from having this uh, ship of state run by a crew of uh, people from other countries. It has to be Saudi. When I was there, we tried hard, and I think since then, to have helped them with establishing a vocational training program, you know, working with your, your hands. It was not very successful. So uh, I think there is this tipping point, and I hope it's going to be a positive one. Uh, but uh, last point, yes, you have two very young future leaders there, and I think that's a good thing. I think basically all that I've heard is, is that, look, that's good. We can now look ahead, not just for a couple of years with a leader, but, but for maybe a couple of decades. And so mm -hmm. there's that feeling of keep us safe, <laughs> and uh, maybe this will. Those are just random thoughts. Thank Terrific. you. Terrific. Thank you. Let's take a couple more before we come back to the panel. Right here in the front row. And then I think we've got one back there. Is that okay? Go ahead. Yes, and then Ariel will go after you. Yeah. Protocol dictates, okay. front row. Hey, uh, Colonel Quartersman, an ambassador. If you could just introduce yourself. Okay, also, sir. sorry. Uh, I'm out of practice. Uh, to a guy that's getting ready to go in a matter of days to the kingdom uh, in a role that I'm still trying to grasp, but specifically it's going to be in a training and advisory role with the Saudi Arabian National Guard. Advice... <laughs> Council, and we don't need to bore the rest of the scholarship here, but I would like a few minutes afterwards if, if either of you gentlemen would be so inclined. And Ariel? Uh, Ariel Cohen, the Atlantic Council. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, can you please uh, drill down a little bit about the uh, Saudi-Iranian dynamics in view of a possible agreement 
um, on uh, the Saudi nuclear pro on the Iranian nuclear program, uh, specifically to what extent the Saudi um, counterpart of a nuclear program can appear, uh, and where will it go? And um, on a separate note, in terms of the Yemen scenario, to what extent do you think that may affect shipping of oil around the peninsula into Bab el Mandeb and up the Red uh, Sea? Thank you. Okay, so we've got uh, we've got King Solomon's uh, pedigree, and we've got uh, education and job risk and nuclear. Tony, do you want to start? Well, first, I think there's no question you have a king who is a pro proven and very competent technocrat. What I am not quite sure, and I think we all need to worry about, is Saudi Arabia isn't the only problem in leadership. You look around, and you have obvious uncertainties in Egypt. There are fewer questions, but they're real in Jordan. Certainly the Saudis are concerned about both. You don't have a stable leadership in Iraq. Now, I think that we have underestimated the problems in Oman. There is a study, I think, by Brookings, which at least surfaced some of the issues, but it's been something of a black hole in terms of actual coverage. The problems in Kuwait, the problems in Bahrain, these are very real. The failure of initiatives to bring the Gulf Cooperation Council together into an effective security body or deal with these issues, initiatives that King Abdullah took, these have continued. Now, I've been listening to good ideas raised since the early 1980s. And to the extent I've seen efforts in integration that went into the security structure, they've largely been a technocratic failure and a waste of money, some of them extraordinarily expensive in character. So the problem for the Saudi leadership is a lot broader, and we keep talking about U.S.-Saudi tensions, but the tensions locally are bad enough. The one area where I've seen improved cooperation is dealing with the Syrian opposition. And I hope that continues, but it's still now a high risk because you're talking. So exactly what is the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Syria or Iraq or Lebanon? And that assumes we can ignore safely the Palestinian and Israeli issues, which don't <coughs> lead me to that conclusion. So I get worried about the idea of continuity here. I get worried about how well the kingdom can deal with a king, a new foreign minister, and these security issues. It's not that I have any pessimism about it, but I have concerns. I think we have to be careful. Now let me go back to a couple of other issues. On, on the job side, Looking at the five-year plan data and the budget plan data and the Saudi Arabian monetary fund data and anything else I can find, they're not making progress. And it is critical. I mean, women are a key aspect of a productive labor force when they're more than half the educated population. The rate of youth unemployment in women is twice the rate of men. That's a lot of talent that isn't being used, but young Saudi men are not getting the jobs. And let me say that, and this will get me in trouble with various universities, there is an amazing lack of correlation globally between education and job creation. Education for jobs, when the economy is creating them, is very valuable. Education for the sake of education has almost no historical impact in moving countries toward development. And this is not popular, but it is unfortunately <coughs> something where nobody trots out numbers to contradict it. And the kingdom has to face this. 
Now, just to go back to the Saudi-Iranian issue, let me just say that every conversation I have with people who are involved in defense, intelligence, or foreign affairs do not see this nuclear agreement as having any positive effect. They are focused exclusively on what they see is the expansion of Iranian influence in the region. And they see us at least as partially to blame. A lot of that I think is unfair, but they see us as having failed to contain Iranian influence. Now some of the more recent meetings may or may not have helped to deal with that. But I also, when I talk to them, am constantly reminded, yes, the nuclear issue has this very high profile. A lot of it is driven by our focus on proliferation, the politics of US and Israeli relationships, by the history of some very key figures like Prince Turkey as supporters of arms control. But when you go to a different level, the focus is on asymmetric warfare capabilities, missiles, and expansion of influence. And you have to be careful here because seen from an Iranian viewpoint, they don't see themselves as a successful, stable military power in other ways. They realize a hell of a lot of their Air Force is stuff they were buying when I was serving in Iran, and that was, for obvious reasons, the early to mid-1970s. Their ships, their surface-to-air missiles, are obsolete by the standards of the Gulf. This is a power which has reason to be concerned, and then you look at the rising level of Shiite-Sunni tension which is only partly related to Islamic extremism in groups like ISIS. And there are serious problems within the kingdom, some of which I think they have perhaps been too strict about dealing with in terms of the way they treat their Shiites. But these problems aren't going away and they're not going to be solved by the nuclear agreement. And when I look at that agreement, I think from what I have seen of the tentative structure, I would certainly support it. But it is not going to contain the Iranian nuclear capability. There are a whole host of things they'll be able to do under any of the frameworks that I've seen to date. And the Saudis are aware of this. The practical problem, however, is if you buy reactors and you get yourself into a fuel cycle, and you then have to create the capability to actually develop and produce a reliable nuclear weapon that is safe to put on a delivery system, it bears no resemblance whatsoever to the kind of nonsense I see coming out of think tanks in Washington, which is all based on a specious idea that all you need is enough fissile material and you have a successful bomb. You know, as a collective intellectual community, we sort of deserve an F minus <laughs> for the quality of serious analysis in dealing with this issue. And it's going to be a very major problem for the Gulf states. Now, what are the options? People like Prince Turkey have talked about, well, if the Iranians can have a fuel cycle, we have to have a fuel cycle. Fine. That puts Saudi Arabia into buying reactors and being able to manage its own fuel cycle. I would not hold my breath, and of course that doesn't move them anywhere toward getting a bomb. They do have missiles, as you know, a strategic missile force, but it's not a force they have a technical background to adapt. And the operators seem to have a fairly heavy Chinese presence. There's no other Arab country that has capabilities in these areas. So where can you turn? And there's only really one clear place, and that is Pakistan. 
Now, whether Pakistan would sell missiles and nuclear weapons, I don't know. They will have significant overcapacity in the production of fissile material relative to their current nuclear weapons program fairly quickly. So there is that potential, and it would be a very dangerous game changer. And it is something which could present us with a real crisis if this nuclear agreement doesn't take place or if it's cheated on, all of which is something we may or may not discover in the next month or so. Well, we've just got a couple minutes left, Frank. I wanted to give you and Jean-Francois a chance for, uh, for a last word, and then we'll, then we'll wrap sure. up. Um, if I could come back to uh, Walt's observation and, um, and Tony, yours on education, the lack of correlation to jobs. Um, we did something here yesterday called hiding in plain sight on Putin's uh, role in the war. Sometimes you see things, uh, you're looking for something, and, you, and, and you, you miss something else. There's an old joke about uh, a watchman, a guard at the gates of a, uh, an establishment, a factory, watching a man come out with a wheelbarrow every day full of straw. And he looks under the straw, doesn't see anything there, but he's suspicious. Every day this guy comes out with a wheelbarrow with straw. He knows there's something wrong there. And he watches day after day, checks the straw, nothing under the straw, there's nothing hidden there, goes up. Um, finally, he, he uh, uh, interrogates the guy and, and he says, you know, what are you doing here? You're taking out Star every day. What are, you, what are you hiding? I know you're, you're taking something. And the guy finally admits he's stealing wheelbarrows. So by not watching the wheelbarrows and looking at the straw, you, you can miss the, what he's doing there. So on the, I'm a product of, of one of the best things the US Senate ever did. Um, I got into global affairs thanks to J. William Fulbright. He was famous when I was a young guy for being against the Vietnam War. I was against the Vietnam War, long hair, beard, the whole thing. But he established the Fulbright Scholarships. So the educational and cultural exchange that came from that, when the US used to fund that sort of thing, was hugely impactful on Americans and the foreigners who came here. The education, I think, uh, was in some ways the straw. Yes, there's knowledge being transferred. Uh, the Saudis who are coming here, the other Gulfies, are studying. some. Maybe some are doing poetry and, and humanities, but many are getting MBAs, many engineering, science, medicine. Um, all that's important, the tech transfer and the knowledge. But what's really important, what's the wheelbarrow, is living for four years when you're in your 20s among Americans and seeing how Americans think. For example, they're not going to school necessarily to get a job in the government. In Egypt, they crank out uh, half a million graduates a year who expect them to go to, to uh, get government jobs. Most Americans who go to school aren't expecting to go out and get government jobs, have it provided for them, just going to finishing school. They're starting businesses. They're, there's, there's a whole different rich array of a way Americans think about work, education, gender roles, gender participation. It's transformative. And so I found when foreigners come back from living in the US, it almost didn't matter what they studied. They come really changed. And that's what I get to. Are there, how many tens of thousands are coming back from education here with a different idea about what it means to be a male, a female, a human, an adult, a, a, an economic actor, uh, how you run your family, how you engage with the world, what you teach your kids, the role of religion, they're not necessarily getting the most important stuff from inside the classroom or the syllabi. So I don't know. I don't mean to paint a sunny picture and say all these terrible trends aren't, aren't real. They are. But there's stuff that's, that's hiding in plain sight I'd like to get at, too. And I think that's where business opportunity also lies. John Francois, the last word. You can choose whether yeah, you're an optimist or a pessimist. Well, I'm relatively optimistic. I think, I think for once, I may not agree totally with uh, w with Dr. Kortzman, but you know, I, I think that in the old, not that long ago, Iran and Saudi Arabia were trying to establish a rapprochement. I mean, the first visit of King Abdullah when he became king was to Iran. 
and there was a lot of talks under Rouhani at the time that you know things should be improving. And I'm not overly concerned. I am concerned, of course, by the terrible things that are happening between Sunni and Shia. Um, but uh, I frankly think these things can be arranged in a way because, uh, again, Abdullah had made a huge effort to work with the Shia in Saudi Arabia. And I think the Shia responded fairly positively at the time. And uh, I think if the situation overall comes to calms down a little bit, things will start improving. I mean, my experience is on Shia-Sunni relations, mostly in Bahrain, where I lived many years. And before the prime minister and all that really pushed the sectarian issues, the Shia and the Sunnis always had some problems. We knew about it. But they lived together. They got married and, and so on. So I think we can see the same things developing in, in, in Saudi Arabia. So I'm not so concerned about that, because I think that, from a political standpoint, can be used or not used, depending on that goes. Uh, just a last note on the Ministry 